Morbidly beautiful radio. For radio. We. And welcome to another episode of the Calling Hours Horror Podcast on Morbidly Beautiful Radio. Once again, it is I, your head undertaker, the dead man Michael Jones of MorbidlyBeautiful.com, Coffin Cuties Magazine, and Digital Dead Magazine. What's going on, world? I hate that we missed last week, but due to unforeseen circumstances, we did not have a show. But we will be making up for it this evening. Tonight, as our featured guest, I'm having a lifelong friend on. His name is David Henley. And we're going to be talking about role-playing games, RPGs, with a particular slant towards horror. Culture has changed so much now where gaming is not just quote-unquote geek or nerd culture anymore. More and more people are playing these games. They've been around for over 40 years, and it continues to be a upward climbing trend in that sphere of, if you want to call it nerddom or geekdom. I fall into that category. So we're going to be talking about a lot of different role-playing games, their history, things like that. So it's really going to be fascinating. Make sure to stay tuned in at 8.30 when Dave comes on. In our digital dismemberment spotlights for the evening, 
We're going to be doing a Screen Factory double feature. We will be covering the collector's edition of Slither. And, boy, I remember going to see this one in theaters. It was just so much fun. has a lot of good actors. Lots of interesting little tie-ins to the Marvel Universe. Hint, hint. So, we'll be covering that one. As well as covering The Devil's Possessed from the Paul Nashy Collection 2 box set. Now, th this was an interesting film as well. Um, I don't think it's one of the better films in the set, but it is a great piece to have as part of the collection. You can certainly appreciate the effort that was put in. Uh, for my tastes, I wish it was a little bit more of a quote-unquote horrific film, but we could certainly do worse than this. We're going to feature several bands in our Metal Massacre Spotlight, and in fact, let's go ahead and get right into that. The first band is Flesh God Apocalypse. From the CD, Agony, the name of the song is The Violation.
and welcome back. You just heard Flesh God Apocalypse from the CD Agony. The song was The Violation. Make sure to head on over to their official website, pick up their new CDs, find out where they're touring, get all the merchandise. Don't forget that in a few moments, we will be having our feature interview this evening with my friend David Henley. We're going to be talking about role-playing RPGs. We're going to touch on horror quite extensively during that process. But before that, it's time for some digital dismemberment. And in our first digital dismemberment spotlight for the evening, we are covering Screen Factory's Blu-ray release from the Paul Nashi Collection 2. The film is The Devil's Possessed. A little bit of background info on this film, just to give you an idea. An evil ruler uses witchcraft and evil spirits to keep his subjects aligned, but then his reign of terror prompts the people to revolt. I find this to be an interesting film that was in this collection. I don't think it really fits the horror subgenre quite as much as some of the other films. And I don't feel like it's the strongest film that could have been added to this collection. But nonetheless, it is an interesting film. It has its moments. Um, It's definitely one of those films that you would look at and feel like if he had a little bit more money or a bigger studio this this could have turned into something a little bit better like Witchfinder general you know movies like that i mean it, it's not the worst film ever but it, it definitely has its moments uh the film was directed by leon klimovsky i hope i said that right some of the names in this are a little bit hard to pronounce but to basically give you an idea um Nashi plays uh, Gilles de la Croix, who the film is loosely based on this man's life. He was a compatriot of Joan of Arc. He was also allegedly a child murderer who was convicted of over a hundred murders of children. So it's, it's loosely based on historical context from his life. And basically what happens is, is Longcray returns home and he goes to see the king. And the king refuses to finance a project that Longcray wants to go about doing. Now, he he starts to become involved with alchemy and witchcraft more at the hands of Lady Georgelle. And he, cl- he declares that he's only interested in science. And he they bring in an alchemist named uh, Simone de Brockville. And it, it turns out that the whole thing is basically a con. Lady Georgiel seems to be more of the bloodthirsty of the two and encourages Longcray to sacrifice young women in order to create gold. So this goes on for a while. Many of the townspeople around his castle are terrorized by his troops and his men. The young ladies are often taken away. They're usually sexually savaged by Long Cray before they're sacrificed and their blood is used in alchemy. So Long Cray has his group of soldiers and men who go out on these quests to take the maidens. Now, a friend of his... Gaston de Melbranche has come back from being in prison and had saved Longcray's life. Well, Gaston runs into several problems with Longcray's men. 
and finds out what Long Cray is doing. And he joins up with the local rebels in the area to try and stop the horrific nature of what Long Cray is doing. So as time goes on throughout the film, the film almost plays a little bit more like an, an action adventure at this. Long Cray considers himself to be the best swordsman uh, in his kingdom. He only worries slightly about Gaston being his equal or better. So, as Gaston tries to stop Long Cray from doing everything that he's doing, uh, Long Cray finds out, storms his castle, takes the love of his life and several of the other rebel leaders. There's plenty of torture in this film. Um, again, it's not quite on the level of the Inquisition. You know, you think about, like I said, movies like Witchfinder General and things like that that certainly handled this topic in a much more graphic manner, definitely in a, in a much more horrific manner. Long Cray is just about to sacrifice Gaston's female friend when he arrives with other troops and there is an epic sword fight. And Long Cray is eventually felled by several arrows, including one through the neck. Again, you know, it's it, this is a little bit of a harder movie to discuss. One of the things that I think really hurt this particular release was the transfers for this are just not quite up to the Screen Factory standards when it comes to the beautiful quality of how some of these other films look. And again, I think that stems back to the fact that the master copies could not be brought back to the States so that a true, really nice transfer could be made. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that this is like VHS poor quality transfer, but you can definitely see print damage. There's uh, definitely a few points where the audio is a little bit fuzzy. So I think it, it takes it, it detracts from the overall look and the feel of the disc and the film. Now, with this one, as with a lot of the films on this collection, there aren't a lot of special features. This one in particular just has the theatrical trailers, both in Spanish and English. The saving grace, of course, is that it is of you know a Blu-ray, and you do get the five film uh the 24-page booklet by uh, Merrick Lipinski about this film. It's definitely a curiosity in Nashi's film career. Again, I kind of feel like I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I feel like there was there was more that could have been done with this. Nashi certainly did much better films before this and did much better films after this. But as a completist, it's it's not the worst film. It's just if you're going into this expecting a horror or a gore fest, you might find yourself disappointed. Now, I will say that there are parts and things in this film that are really good. I would say that the cinematography looks really good. I would say, for the most part, the score and the soundtrack really fit in. What little blood and gore there is in the film, I, I think, looks pretty good. The costumes are very colorful. So there, there are things to like about this film. I just feel that fans that are expecting an over-the-top, nasty film are going to be a little bit disappointed with what they get from this. Now, that being said, of course, like I said, it's a great addition to this film collection, I think it's something that Nashi fans will like to see more as a curiosity than anything else. Um, overall, I would give this particular title probably a two and a half out of five. You really have to me. This is one of those films you really have to be in the mood in. Again, as a if you're a Nashi fan, I think this will whet your appetite for the rest of the box set. I think that they're there are much better titles that are included on the rest of this set. So make sure to head on over to ScreamFactory.com to pick up your copy of The Devil's Possessed that is part of the Paul Nashi Collection 2. And look, really look 
you know, really, really try to give it an, an, an open eye. Like I said, as, as a big time horror fan, you might not get exactly what you're looking for, but Scream Factory does get kudos for including it in the set and giving us an oddity in Nash's collection that we wouldn't normally see. Coming up in just a few moments, we're going to go into our feature interview with my friend David Henley. We're going to be talking about horror in role-playing, specifically role-playing games like Dungeons & Dragons, Rifts, Warhammer, White Wolf Games, and All Flesh Must Be Eaten. But before that, we're going to go into our second Metal Massacre Spotlight the name of the band is Necrogoblicon. The name of the CD is Stench. And the song is No One Survives. Yeah. 
welcome back, and it's time for our feature interview this evening. And tonight, because of the subject matter, I'm bringing in a lifelong friend of mine. And this is a guy that I consider to be my RPG gaming mentor. He's taught me so much about role-playing, not just from the horror aspect, which we'll be touching on this evening, but just role-playing in general. Everyone, welcome David Henley to the show. Dave, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. You know it. You know, for years, this is a subject that I've always wanted to have you on the podcast and talk about, and I, and I think it's finally time. Kind of give people an idea how you first got involved with RPGs. Uh, when I first seriously got involved in gaming, I was in the Navy uh, in 1984. I met a guy named Chris Schaefer. Uh, he introduced me to Dungeons and Dragons, Top Secret, and a little game called Combo World. All of them were TSR properties because they were basically the big dog of RPGs in that time. Now, I remember right before I met you, when I was in high school, I had really started my role playing with games like Shadowrun and stuff like that. But I remember right after I got out of the army and I met you, Ravenloft was a campaign in D and D that always intrigued me. Now, as far as collections go and things like that, you have one of the more impressive role playing collections I've ever seen, and. I remember you and I talking about Ravenloft a lot, and without getting in, we don't have to get into extreme specifics, but can you kind of talk about, especially with D&D, how horror plays such a big element in that campaign world? Well, if you're talking about Ravenloft specifically, it really wasn't a campaign world when it was conceived. Tracy and Laura Hickman wrote Ravenloft as a one-shot uh, scenario. And I-6, which is the designator for the module, is one of the most popular and most played RPG modules ever. Not just in horror, but in general. Uh, it's an awesome game. There's, it's replayability is probably the most unique thing about it. I mean, you use a deck of regular playing cards to generate a change in your plot every time you go through the module. You have specific goals that are laid out by the cards, depending on how the cards fall when you deal them out as the game master preparing to run the game. Items that you need move around in the locale. People that you need to encounter to gain information from, move around in the locale, where you actually meet and uh, confront the main villain moves around based on the cards you draw. Now, talking about just general history of role-playing, was Dungeons & Dragons really the first role-playing system? Well, in 1974, Dungeons & Dragons was released. Uh, if you want to take it back, you could actually say that Little Wars, which was actually developed by H.G. Wells, would be the first role-playing game. Now, he developed it as a rule system for miniatures, because he was a, a huge fan of uh, skirmish tactics. Uh, <clears throat> he was a huge fan of strategic games. And what he did was he took 10 soldiers, children's toys, and developed a system of rules so that you could reenact uh, battles from the Napoleonic Wars and various wars from a histor historical point so that he could just lay it out on his... And I believe, if I remember correctly, he would lay it out on his parlor floor, have his friends over, they would choose which armies they wanted to run, and then they would set the victory conditions, and then they would play. It's very similar to uh, mini miniature war gaming as we know it today. That is actually where that started. Uh, I think that there was a little bit of uh, what we would call role-playing, but it was really more of a miniature war game. And then 
that game inspired what would later become more modern war games. And then from the war gaming community that both Dave Arnonson and Gary Gygax were members of, that's where Dungeons and Dragons was born. Now, was Dungeons and Dragons your your first foray into role playing? Yes, it was. Uh, where I grew up and the people I knew didn't really have a lot of access to role players or RPGs. So that was the first game that I was interested in playing. Couldn't find anybody to play. I, I did play in like one short session with my cousin, uh, but I didn't actually start playing those games seriously again until 1984 after I was in the Navy. Now, another popular game series, and it seems extremely popular today, was the Cthu- Call of Cthulhu. Yeah, Call of Cthulhu was the first horror role-playing, role-playing system developed, uh, released in the early 80s. Uh, it was published by Chaosium Incorporated. Uh, it's basically uh, the Cthulhu mythos, based on H.P. Lovecraft's writings, as well as you know other members of the mythos lead, uh, such as Robert E. Howard, Robert Block, and etc., Now, with those two being two of the (laughs) oldest games, and of course two of the most popular games, they've endured into today. With those two particular games specifically, what is it do you feel makes people still want to play them today? What makes them just must-have games that people get together weekly and, and just play for hours? Well, it's because... They're all about telling a story. People have always loved stories from the time that we first started drawing pictures on walls and caves. And they're going to love stories until we no longer exist. Uh, stories reach inside us and touch things that are based in emotion. They're, they're primal urges, they're primal beliefs. So what these games do is it gives an opportunity for a group of people get together and enjoy a type of story that they're all interested in where each one of them has some part of the narrative that they can control or at least add to. It's collaborative storytelling. That's all RPGs are. Now one of the things for for people that are not RPG players or or who hear that and it kind of roll their eyes Know, oh, imagination, oh, this, oh, that. You know, part of the dynamic that I find interesting about all of these games and some of these other games that I'm going to mention later is that they all don't use the same system. So kind of as an example, you know, d and I remember in the early days, D20 system had all different kinds of dice, things like that. Cthulhu played with a little bit of a different system. Can you talk about a little bit how different games use different methods to progress action? Well, <clears throat> there are games that use various dice to uh, randomize effects and outcomes while you play the game. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons uses the widest variety of dice in the game d20 down to a d4. Uh, Call of Cthulhu kept it a little simpler. Uh, You did have a few other dice rolls involved, but almost everything that you did in Call of Cthulhu used what's called percentile dice. You roll two ten-sided dice that are different colors to generate numbers from 1 to 100. And then your skills are based on uh, that same sort of percentage point system. Uh, and that's really kind of easier for a lot of people because you're used to a base 10 mathematical system. It, it's very natural. You have 10 fingers, 10 toes. Everybody's good with 10. Uh, then there are, all, there are various other forms of dice system that are used. Uh, really, it's more about what the person is interested in when they sit down to play. Are you interested in working on the mechanical side of things, where you're working with percentages, keeping track of your numbers, that sort of thing, or are you more interested in a story where the dice don't really mean as much? Uh, for instance, in a game called Ubiquity, 
for a game system. Uh, Ubiquity uses what's called a binary die. You have a die that has zeros and ones. A one equals a success on that die, a zero equals a failure, or a zero. Uh, and then you'll have various target numbers that you have to hit to accomplish certain things. Uh, I think the average target number is a two. So if your rating allows you to roll three dice, odds are you're going to succeed. Now, as more and more games came out through the 80s, one of the ones that you introduced me to, and of course now we met long after the 80s, but just following a historical context of the gaming, GURPS was another system that you introduced me to. Yes, GURPS is probably uh, considered one of the most mechanically accurate from a mathematics standpoint game systems because it uses a D6 uh, and you'll roll two or three D6 to accomplish anything you're trying to accomplish and then you're going into the deep mathematical side of things. Are you talking about a bell curve? Which all that does, a bell curve measures the probability of a positive or negative outcome. And it has a very even distribution based on the number spread for your attributes and skills in the game. So it's a very fair way to determine whether you succeed or fail. It's easy to balance your skills against your opponent's skills and make sure that everybody has a fair chance at success. Now, as time went on and, you know, we played a lot of D&D &D and, you know, we stepped a little bit into GURPS and, and the Cthulhu while we were playing. One of the games that I had started running and you really encouraged me to step into it was Rifts. Right. And Rifts was one of those games. And I guess we could say this about any game, but I really felt like for the first time with Rifts, that was the kind of game system where you could just really just expand yourself in ways that you couldn't in a lot of other systems. I always felt like Rifts was the first gaming system that I learned how to run where you could literally bring in anything. And that's something that we have started to see more and more with current games that are out. Now, you didn't run Rifts um, nearly as much as I did, at least in those beginning years. What were your thoughts on that role-playing game and how it brought so many different spectrums into it like that. I loved the concept of it. I loved the background story. I loved the possibilities of Rift. I just didn't enjoy the actual mechanics of it. Uh, I didn't mind playing, but it wasn't really a game that I really wanted to run. It was, it was just too... Clunky's a good word. Yeah, a lot of people do say that, actually. Clunky's a good word, because you're right. There was, it was, as far as gaming goes, that was one of the few games that, that I ran that it was like, you basically had to take a day just to set up your characters and your skills and everything that went along right, with it. Right. And there are a lot of games, or older games, that had that same problem. And that's one of the main things that's changed in game design over the last, I'd say, decade. It's more about uh, being able to sit down, throw together a group of characters in about a half an hour and be up and running and playing the game. Uh, and Fate is one of the cool systems that does that really well. Uh, Fate and Fate Accelerated are uh, what are called pickup games. You, you and a group of people sitting around, you decide, hey, let's just play a game, throw together some characters kind of come up with a concept for a story you want to run through, and you're up and running in half an hour once everybody's familiar with the system. So, you know, you, you look at the time period that you started playing in the 80s, okay? How would you say, we'll, we'll do this as we go through the different games because we're going to hit on different decades, but what do you feel like in the 80s was the main sense or the main draw when it came to RPGs in that time period? Well, really talk about that a general sense. For me, I love to read when I was a kid. I love stories about the, you know, the lone hero up against 
great odds or somebody that stood up in the face of evil and stuck to their principles. You know, that's really what I was wanting to emulate. I wanted to be able to sort of live through a story like the ones I read when I was a kid. Uh, and I think that everybody around me that I played with was motivated by that to some degree or another. There were guys who liked to just get in there and roll the dice and kind of go up against whatever challenge there was and try to figure out how to overcome that challenge. You know, they, they were more into the puzzle and the, the actual statistical probabilities that were involved in an encounter. Uh, me, I was always a story guy. So. You know, and, and I'll agree with that. That was one of the dynamics that I really enjoyed playing in your game sessions. I mean, um, for people that aren't gamers, you know, sometimes we might use terms like hack and slash or dungeon crawler or things like that. One of the things that I really liked about your stories was, is, is it was like reading a story. It was so richly detailed. It wasn't always about drawing your sword and going in and massacring a bunch of goblins or going up against the undead or things like that. For you, kind of talk about how, how it was important for you to be such a vivid storyteller as opposed to just, hey, just pick up a bunch of dice and throw them on the table and see what happens. I think that's just because I've always enjoyed being a storyteller. I love to, <clears throat> I love to read when I was younger. So then I actually ended up telling my younger siblings stories. I would tell my cousins stories. I would tell other kids stories. And uh, so it's just something that I developed from a very young age. It was always basically a part of me as long as I can remember. Uh, as to the gaming side of things, when I first started gaming, uh, I played a couple of games. And I was talking to... Chris Schaefer, who I mentioned earlier, and I was interested in running a game. Well, at the time, we were out in the middle of the uh, Indian Ocean, and he only had a couple of books with him. He was basically just reading through his old first edition, and at that time, it wasn't old, his first edition Dungeon Master's Guide, and that's really all he had with him. He had been playing in the game for three or four years, so he knew enough about it that he could actually just run the game with just that one book. So we started talking, and uh, he said, you know, if you want to run a game, I'll help you with the dice. I mean, that, at that time, I didn't even know what dice did what. So I came up with an idea based on a story I'd written when I was a teenager, or a young teen, anyway. So we sat down the next day, and we started playing that game. And uh, basically all I did, there were charts in the back of the Dungeon Master's Guide that I used for the, the monster names that I was looking for. So I threw together this map. I drew basically to a maze with all these little things in it. And I started talking about uh, this war that was going on in the area. And I introduced a couple of encounters with some orcs. And when I did it, uh, I was kind of channeling some things I had watched. Like uh, just a year before, I had watched the Ralph Bakshi Lord of the Rings. The movie, well, it was a movie, the only movie at that time. So while I'm sitting there and we're getting going on the game, I've got all the characters made, I start describing the setting. The group's outside this old fortress, getting ready to enter and explore it. I describe an encounter with the orcs where they come out of the woods. And the whole time I'm doing this, I'm picturing in my mind the way they moved and sounded and the things that happened in, the, in that movie and then The Hobbit and all the other books that I've read. And then, because I was a huge Robert E. Howard fan, I kind of pushed it away from the Tolkien-esque high fantasy kind of thing. I got a little more down and dirty, a little more blood and guts with it in the way that they were encountering these monsters. And there was a swarm of them. I didn't know anything about game balance. Then. At that time, that term really didn't even exist. You didn't worry about uh, challenge ratings and things like that so that you could tell whether the party actually had a fair chance to defeat a creature. Uh, it was more about 
running into something, deciding whether you wanted to take a chance trying to feed it. You didn't have a number that told you that you could or couldn't. You just played it by ear. Anyway, <clears throat> when they saw what I was describing coming toward them, they hit the great heroes who were actually just starting out on their adventuring career, so weren't very powerful. They hit. And then I described what happened and all the things that were said by the creatures as they were discussing the camp that they had found and da-da-da-da-da and who their master was and why they were in the area. I evoked a, uh, as dark an atmosphere as I could. And as I was telling this story, as I just let myself go and I started to picture these things in my mind, the game faded away and I was just telling the story. Mm -hmm. See, now, and, and we'll touch on this aspect here again as we talk about games that we've played and stuff but you know that's that's an interesting aspect you t you know when when you put together a player group as, as a game master like you are you know do you look for a particular type of player what do you look for before you bring someone into one of your play groups I don't look for anything specific uh, I talk about Things. I tell stories about older games that I ran, things that happened, other people that played the game, how we laughed, how we got angry, what was good, and fun. Mm -hmm. And then the people that are interested, that seem really interested in doing it, then I'll talk to them more about it, make it so we can get a character, and let them see how it kind of works. Actually, in the past, I've had a couple of games where I had a group of people go over to their house, we would start to play the games. They might have a roommate or a relative who really didn't have any interest at the time in playing the game. And they would sit over and watch television or do something else. But usually at some point in the evening, there would be something going on that drew their attention to the table. And then I've actually had a couple of instances where people would start to throw out suggestions as to what people would characters should do or where they should go or hey maybe you should pick that up or look at that or what about that guy he said that and then all of a sudden it's like well hey you know if you're interested if you want to play if you want to be a part of what's going on come on over here and we'll get you going right and i've picked up quite a few players that way now i would say that the 70s and 80s style of role playing were, were typically more high fantasy you think Lord of the Rings, you think, and I'm not saying that's all it was, but it, my general impression of gaming was that the, the 70s and the 80s were more high fantasy. As we moved into the 90s, right before I met, you know, before I met you, I would say that gaming started to take a change and it started to go a little bit more, um, I don't know if I want to say gothic, I don't know if I want to say cyberpunk, steampunk, it seemed like it moved into more of that modern technology era well, in the of late, gaming. In the later 80s, uh, because of the advancements in uh, computer technology, which, I mean, looking back now, it's very primitive, but it seemed you know, like we were moving towards something like Blade Runner. Sure. Yeah. And uh, when our entertainment changed, that's when gaming started to change because the gaming evolves based on the other entertainment that they have available. And the reason I would bring that up is White Wolf became a huge player True. starting in the early 90s. True. So in your opinion, looking back at the White Wolf era of gaming, you know, what were your thoughts on games like Vampire the Masquerade, Werewolf, Wraith, things like that? They were innovative at that time. Uh, there were several instances in older games where we would build a character that was a werewolf or was a vampire, you know, organically over a period of time. You know, you encounter the monster, you're infected with lycanthropy or vampirism or something else. And so then you become more and more of a monster. But back in the older versions of games, it would be that the game master would usually take 
partial or total control of your character when you were under the sway of that curse or infection. Uh, what White Wolf did is they reimagined that to where you were playing someone who was a vampire or a werewolf or a mummy or whichever iteration of their games you were interested in. So it was a different point of view. It was a different aspect of role playing where you saw the world not through the eyes of a, a knight in shining armor trying to stamp out these evil pockets of dark creatures. Rather, you became that creature. And I think it was really more focused on looking at the darker side of humanity itself. And I think that's an interesting aspect. Again, when we talk about the earlier years of gaming, it always seemed to focus more on being the knight, being the paladin, you know, being someone who fights against the evil. Not that you couldn't play an evil character, but once we moved into, it seemed like, like I said, the 90s, it seemed like it became very fashionable to play the monster, to play the bad guy, to be that supernatural entity. And you had mentioned that entertainment plays a part in that. But to you, again, as, as a game master, how did that dynamic change for you where you were used to people playing the knight, <laughs> the priest, you know, those types of things, to wanting to play vampires, demons, and things like that? It was something that was always there, really, as I've said before. Mm -hmm. It's just that in the 90s, people started to implement rule sets that allowed you to make it the focus of the game rather than a part of the game. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that, to be honest, that shift was because of some of the things that happened in the real world as far as the way politics moved and some of the other things that happened in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, some of the the wars that were fought, uh, especially some of the darker things, like the things that happened over in Bosnia. Well, I said, 96 was the year that I first started role-playing with you. I just got out of the Army. We had a mutual friend, came over. You guys got me hooked on, we were playing, I guess it was second edition Dungeons & Dragons at that time. Um you know, and then, of course, we progressed into things like Shadowrun and, and Rifts and things like that. And gaming just continued to evolve. Now, in the 90s, you know, gaming has always kind of been considered nerd culture, quote unquote. But it seemed like once we got to the mid to late 90s, gaming started to become more and more socially acceptable in groups even outside of gaming. It was it was accepted a little right. bit more. Now, to you, what do you feel like started that? What started to make the gaming culture not just geek culture, but a general culture? Because with the advent of more advanced home video games, more people were exposed to some of the same elements that tabletop gamers were used to but then the format where you didn't have to have a group, you didn't have to read a bunch of books, you mm -hmm. basically slapped a cartridge into a machine, it produced this fantasy or science fiction world where you could kind of lose yourself in that world for a little while, whether you were an adult coming home from work and just trying to decompress after a day, or if you were a kid who was being rewarded for doing well in school or doing your chores. And as time went on, People developing the games kind of, uh, or in my opinion at least, developed a strategy for how to determine who their audience was. And as those games progressed, became more complex and more focused and more targeted, they found that uh, their audience was much broader than they ever thought it was in the first place. That everybody has a little bit of, I want to. I want to be that knight, or I want to be that bank robber, or I want to be, you know, whatever. Right. Now, as we start to move into the 2000s and some of the games that we, we see from there, um, one of the ones that 
we had kind of started to mess around with, but we I never really got to play a lot of it. You know, circumstances in life happen, and that was Legend of the Five Rings. Yes. And I know you and I have talked a little bit about how horror plays a part in that system. Kind of talk about Legend of the Five Rings and how that was different than any of the other games we had played before then. One of the big developers of Legend of the Five Rings was John Wick. <clears throat> and that's another example of how role-playing took another turn, I think. And in my opinion, I think that when Wick designed that game, he was all about the story. Mm-hmm. Whereas older games had more dice mechanics, and more fiddly bits, if you will. He made it so that you could make make it as detailed as you wanted it to be when it came to conflict resolution. But it was really about a human story. He, he was awesome at bringing that to the table. He gave you the tools you needed so that you could do that. You could drive a character forward. You could drive a narrative it wasn't so heavy that it would weigh you down or get in the way of telling that story. So you could just, again, as I was saying earlier, when you're telling your story, the game fades away, and you're just engaged with the story. Now, one of the games that you had started to run that really resonated with me in terms of story was All Flesh Must Be Eaten. Right. Uh, it's by uh, Eden Studios. This is what's called the Uni system. Now, of course, for those of you that don't know, All Flesh Must Be Eaten sounds exactly like what it is. It primarily, not entirely, dealt with a lot of zombie stuff. And, you know, I, I found that to be interesting because I, playing D&D with you, I always enjoyed the fantasy elements and, and how you did incorporated everything into your stories, but All Flesh Must Be Eaten really was one of those games that struck a nerve with me, and I, and I think you knew that going in, knowing what a horror fan that I was. You know, the 2000s to me really saw another shift in the way that games were put out and the content, and at this point, I, I don't know if splatterpunk's the word that I wanted to use, but gaming definitely to me became that much more grittier, that much more realistic. You know, why is it, in, in particular in the gaming genre, do you feel like zombies became such a huge focal point and basically, I want to say they had their own gaming system, but I mean, that's what All Flesh Must Be Eaten really was. Well, actually, the game system was developed for a game by C.J. Cirilla titled Witchcraft. Later on, the guys from Eden Studios partnered with him and used the mechanics of the system for All Flesh Must Be Eaten. Uh, and All Flesh Must Be Eaten, the main thing I liked about it was it was the first one that, where you could actually emulate the zombie survival horror movies of Romero and those sorts of directors where you're, you just didn't hack it a zombie to pieces, and then it just falls down, and it's dead again. But you had to be specific in the way you attacked it. It was only vulnerable to certain things. So it really brought that tension that was present in those movies to the gaming table. And, you know, for me, maybe it, maybe it's because I am such a horror fan, and God knows I have tormented you over the years with films and Things like that. Um, <laughs> that would be a whole other podcast where we could talk about bad movies that I've made you watch over the years. But, but some were so bad they were really good. That's true, too. But it was it was just, there was something that was so visceral about that game in particular. I don't know. It was, it was almost more cinematic to me than anything else that you would ever run. And t- to this day, it's probably still my favorite campaign that you ran. But you talk about, you know, the different systems and stuff, and what a lot of people may not realize is, you know, the heroes say all these titles. You and I kind of touched on this. You know, a lot of the systems these days, or a lot of the games these days, use the same systems. 
can you kind of talk about how different games are being able to tie into one another by using the same basic rules and systems? Well, first of all, in my opinion, it's good business. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, in the older games, like, let's use T.S. Aldrich, who were the first guys who created and published Dungeons & Dragons. When they wanted to do fantasy, they would do Dungeons & Dragons. Then if you had science fiction, you would do Donald Duck. If you wanted espionage, you had to buy Top Secret. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm sure that there are plenty of people like me who played all three, spent their money, and helped them stay in business. But there are a lot of people who wanted one or the other <clears throat> and might have gone over to the other side if they didn't have to buy a separate book. So I think that's one reason a lot of companies are now saying, okay, here's the rules. We're separating the rules. This is how the mechanics of the game work. And then over here we have this genre information for you. We have this genre information for you. If you want to do just this one thing, then that's all you have to get. But if you get all of this to go with it, then you get all these other options. Uh, one of the best examples for that with modern games is Numenera by Monty Cook Games uh, uses what's called the Cypher system. It's a D20 based system for gamers who understand what that means. Uh, it is set on a world, it's Earth, but it is so far in the future that it is completely alien. It seems to be a fantasy post apocalyptic world. history of the earth it has, we've been invaded by aliens we've suffered great catastrophic uh, events like meteor strikes and so on and so forth so with that system you can say okay I'm going to set it in the, the canon setting and play in this world like it is or you can roll back time and say okay well I want to just play late 20th century early 21st century, I want to play 23rd or 24th century. If you want to go into something where it's like Star Trek, there was a period of time in their history where we did have a, uh, a space empire, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so by doing that, this gaming company has now broadened its appeal. It's drawn in all these people who might not have paid attention to it if it had just been a post-apocalyptic fantasy world. It allows all sorts of stories from all periods of time. You could actually just roll back and say, okay, I just want to go ride. I want to ride around and be a knight and explore dungeons and chase King Arthur around. You could do that too. Now, I think one of the real game changers for modern day gaming or the company, um, Savage Worlds. Uh, Pinnacle Entertainment, Shane Hensley. Savage Worlds is actually an outgrowth of uh, the Great Rail Wars, which was a miniatures game, a war game, basically, that Pinnacle uh, created. Uh, now, before that, they created the first version of a role-playing game called Deadlands, which was aptly described as a spaghetti western with meat. Yes, yeah. I enjoyed Deadlands the few that, times I played that is basically, you take a Clint Eastwood spaghetti western, you mix in some zombies, some classic ghosts, uh, like gothic horror, and a little bit of witchcraft, and that's Deadlands. And it was, it did a great job of turning genres on their head, or I think it did. Uh, it was released in 1997. I remember when I bought it and I started reading through it, it was the first role-playing game where, as I was reading it, it was like reading a book. It was like actually sitting down and reading this story, the voice it was written in. It's one of the best written role-playing games I've ever read. Well, you know, like I said, with Savage Worlds, what I found really, what I find really unique about it is how so many of 
the older games now use that system. You can run rifts in Savage Worlds. You right. can run, I mean, give people an idea. I mean, how many of these games we've mentioned that can all be well, incorporated with, with Savage that? Worlds, Savage Worlds is a, basically a generic role-playing system, which means you can, you can run any genre game you want. Uh, they have several different setting books, uh, Deadlands, which I've already talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, they have Rippers, which is gothic steampunk horror. Uh, and the, the list goes on and on and on. There are several different companies that are actually licensed through Pinnacle to use the Savage Worlds uh, system. It's just like Rifts, really. It's mm -hmm. just it's a little simpler. It's a little cleaner in its implementation of the dice rolling. Uh, it's what's called a die step system or step die system. I've heard it said both ways. Uh, basically, instead of having a number value that determines what your statistics or your character are, you'll actually have a die type that you use. A D4 is poor, and then it scales up through D6, D8, D10, D12, D12 plus 1, and all the way up to D12 plus 4. They have, you can do science fiction, superheroes, horror, uh, and any mixture of those. Now, another game that I want to mention, just so the gamers that are listening don't get pissed off at me because I didn't mention it. And you had kind of mentioned this to me because I've never played it, and that's Warhammer. Right, and I'm not really that familiar with Warhammer. I do have some of the books. I've read through it. I've never actually... <laughs> had a group to play the game. Uh, it is one of the older ones. It's actually by, uh, well, it's actually from Britain. It was basically, in my opinion, uh, a European answer to Dungeons and Dragons. Hmm. Now, TSR, the people who created and published Dungeons and Dragons, did have an office in Britain. Uh, there's a whole series of modules. There's a whole basically subculture of people that played in first edition AD&D from uh, Britain. But Warhammer, to my knowledge, is their baby. They created it. It implemented uh, a lot. There was a lot of dark things about Warhammer. It was a very dirty, grim, gritty world. Uh, basically, you made a character and you planned on dying. <laughs> uh, that's that's straight up how it was. That's how I felt about uh, Cthulhu, but you know, well, you know, with Cthulhu, it wasn't about dying. Dying, you know, that was quick and easy and clean and done. With called Cthulhu, you slowly realized that you were in a hopeless situation. You went insane, hmm. which ties right in with what Lovecraft wrote. So, in real life, I mean, hey. well, you know, it, it depends <laughs> on the life. <clears throat> now, one of the things that I find interesting, too, and a lot of people may not realize this, you know, we talked a lot about dice. Dice always seems to come up in these conversations. But it seemed like once we got to the 2000s, the dynamic of using dice in role-playing games changed as well. It started to be now you have cards and miniatures and everything else. Kind of talk about how that evolved role-playing a little bit. Oh, well, it's just because some people prefer use cards. Basically the dice are just a randomizer. Some people prefer cards. Other people prefer um, nothing. I mean, there are games where you don't use any dice or anything like that. Basically, as you play, <coughs> as you play, your <coughs> basically as you play, your character will bank points or some resource that you can use to then buy an outcome that you want. There are games where players will bid against each other or against their other opponents. So really, it just depends on whether you like to roll dice and track dice and keep track of that sort of thing, or if you prefer that to have a hand of cards and be able to sort of play them, you know, kind of know what's in your hand and strategize based on where you think it's going to go, depending on what cards you're drawing in your deck. You know, we, we kind of talked about, quote-unquote, geek culture 
nerd culture, things like that. And one of the things that really exploded, I felt like, once the 2000s hit was the convention circuit. Now it's extremely popular to go to gaming conventions. Cosplay is such a huge thing now, and a lot of that is based off of role-playing. What are your thoughts on how that's become so popular, and what are your thoughts on, you know, I, I don't think you, I don't, I don't, You've never told me. I don't think you've ever been to one of those conventions. But what you know, when you see these pictures on social media and stuff of of people dressing up as you know Strahd from Ravenloft and things like that, you know, are you surprised that it has grown so dynamically to the point it has today? No, uh, because again, as our technology and society has changed, more and more people are realizing that. All those interests intertwine. The people who enjoy comic books and movies and video games will also enjoy tabletop role-playing games because they all incorporate the same thing. Uh, I've never been to a gaming convention per se, but I have been to conventions like science fiction conventions, which would have authors there that you could speak with, signed copies of their books, there would be committee or various events going on throughout the day, they would have some gaming events where you'd be going actually playing games, you could go view a film, basically people started to realize that they didn't have to be part of this group or that group or the other group, that was all one thing, mm -hmm. that was all just entertainment and fun and it just depends on what you want to do at the point in time at, in which, at which you do it. Now, one of the things that's also changed about the gaming industry is it used to be we'd have to go out and buy the books. You know, go to your local bookstore, your local gaming store. You had to buy the books if you wanted to play. Now, with the advent of technology, computers, and all that stuff, you can get so much stuff through download, do you feel like that has helped gaming, or does that hurt gaming? It's, well, it's helped gaming overall because it broadens the audience. It gives you more people who have more access to the information. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are still plenty of places where you don't have stores that are dedicated to role-playing books and that sort of thing. So, basically, if you have internet and you have an interest find somewhere, uh, one of the best places to go, in my opinion, is One Bookshelf Incorporated. Uh, they've got several different sites, some of it's for role-playing games, some of it's comic books, some of it's card games, some of it's uh, miniatures games. Uh, so if you're interested, go check out One Bookshelf Incorporated, and you'll be able to find anything that you want. It also gives uh, smaller game designers and developers a chance to get their product out there. They may not have the resources to produce an actual you know, paper, hard copy product. Mm -hmm. So they basically put the thing together and create an Adobe file or whatever format they put it in, Mobi, etc., etc. And they put it up on that site and they... Uh, Try to make a little bit of money, or at least attract some attention. There are several people who actually just do it for the love of it. <coughs> and they have several different programs to allow you to do that. Now, one of the other things that I've found really fascinating about gaming culture these days, and you were the one that showed me this, I never realized through YouTube and websites and all that how much of an online presence gaming has with podcasts with video casts and just how many celebrities oh, are into role playing. Oh my god. Kinda of, kinda of delve into that for basically a uh, a lot of people don't realize that the people that a lot of the voice actors that do the voices for their favorite video game probably role play. Several actors that you see on television role play. Producers, writers, directors Lots of people in Hollywood role play. And it's not a surprise. If you think 
think about it because they're storytellers. They're artistic. They want to create and share those creations and share those experiences. So it's no, like, uh, for instance, the one name that pops into my head right now, Deborah Ann Wall. If you don't know who that is, just type in True Blood to your search system, whatever it is, Google it, etc. And it will tell you who Deborah Ann Wall is. She uh, has appeared on a couple of different things through uh, Wizards of the Coast, uh, Force Gray series, DM'd by Matt Mercer, who also DMs Critical Role, which if you know anything about gaming at this point in time, you've probably heard of Critical if not, go look it up on YouTube. Uh, make sure you've got plenty of snacks and stuff to drink because some of those <laughs> can get pretty long, but they're really good. Well, what I like, too, is um, they don't kitty it down. No, not at all. It is. Uh, they will tell you up front the uh, adult language, adult content. Uh, you have been warned if you still want to watch, watch. I mean, it is pretty fun, you know, and here's a name I, I know. People are going to love it or hate it when I say it. You know, Will Wheaton. It's uh, it's huh? it's it's just really funny to see some of these actors. Not funny, but it's it's cool to see actors that I know don't know personally, but that I know of who are into role playing. Never would have thought of it. People like Vin Diesel apparently is a very oh, large role playing fan. He's a huge fan of Vin Diesel. He's actually written uh, like little words in various role playing books. And he wrote a foreword in one of them. Yeah, he's huge. Matter of fact, you can look up a video called D&D Diesel, hmm. where he is game mastered by Matt Mercer just before the release of uh, The Last Witch Hunter, I think it was. Okay. Now, I, I've got to ask this just as a general film question. Why have we never seen a good Dungeons and Dragons themed movie? Because they have been focused on trying to make it like the game cannot emulate a tabletop role-playing system that way. Basically, if you want to make a movie that way, you just need to put a camera in a room with a bunch of people playing the game, and that's already been done on Critical Role. True, true. If you want a good movie, uh, again, I can't think of the actor's name right now, and I apologize to him. He also was on uh, True Blood, played the werewolf Joe probably look that up and plug it in here somewhere. Yeah, we can do that. But uh, he wants to make a version of the Dragonlance Chronicles. If you're a fantasy fan, you've probably read some of those books by Tracy Pickman and Margaret Weiss. They're awesome. Uh, he wants to make a film based on those. And he's got it completely right. He basically said when somebody asked him about it, the reason there hasn't been a good D&D movie is because they haven't focused on the characters. Hmm. They haven't created characters that actually caught your attention, kept your attention, and made you invest in the story. Stories are about people. Mm -hmm. Role-playing games are about the characters how they interact with the world. Not what level somebody is or what monster they're up against and that sort of thing. So when they finally decide to set a movie in one of the campaign settings for Dungeons and Dragons to create a compelling story with interesting characters, that's when we get a good D&D movie. Now, I, you know, I feel like this is this is a very valid question. Looking back at your, what, 35, at least 35 years of, of playing, did you ever think that gaming would be where it's at now? I didn't think about it, really, to be honest. I, I just wanted to play. Uh, I'm glad to see that it's more well-known and uh, widespread. Bad to see people who are known in other fields of entertainment and art 
coming out and saying, hey, I play these games. These games are cool. They teach you a lot. And you're fine. I'm really happy to see that. Because, you know, when I first started, it was, you're going to do what? It's right. A fr- it's a Friday night, and you're 20 years old, and you're going to do what? Right. Why aren't you going out to a, you know, a movie or a bar or going dancing or this and that or whatever? Now, you look at how far gaming has come. What do you see in general for role-playing? And because horror has become such a mainstream focus these days, where do you see the future of horror in gaming? Um, It's hard for me to do that, because in my opinion, there's no such thing as fantasy role-playing or horror role-playing. Or sci-fi role playing. It's all just it's the same thing. Mm-hmm. Because I could put you on a spaceship, you know, out orbiting Jupiter's moons, and it could be just as horrific as being in Dracula's castle. Sure. So it's kind of hard for me to say where the future of horror and role playing is going to be. Uh, I think that. I would guess that in the next 10 years or so, we'll probably see another big shift uh, simply because our nation has been at war for so long. It's going to, you'll see that kind of feed back into things. Both internally and externally. Yeah. Because you're going to see it in in all the media. Again, role playing is tied to all the other media. So the trends that you see in movies or in music or in just static art, it's going to be the same trends in role playing. Now, we only have a few minutes left, but I definitely want to get this out there. Now, you have been working on your own, I don't know if we want to call it our, your own role playing game, but maybe your own it's setting. A, it's a setting, multi dimensional, spans several thousand years of history. Uh, it involves, and again, this is a good example of what I've been going over. It involves aliens and fantasy, what we would consider fantasy beings, magic, uh, advanced science. Uh, basically, it's speculative fiction. That's the, that's what I like to call it. It's just speculative fiction. You can tell any story you want with it. Uh, it's pretty expensive, and I can use any help I can get. <laughs> now, do you have anything out there if people... Want to try and get some of your campaign settings? Uh, You know, if you go to One Bookshelf Incorporated, go to RPG Now, drive through RPG, type in Coin Toss Games, you'll see some of the stuff that I've already put out. Uh, Some of it is still in development, and of course, some of it will be revised eventually. I mean, you know, I've had a chance to be on the inside and and see a lot of the things that you're developing, and and I really feel like. You know, if, if people want to do something that's really, in, you know, it's involved, but it's interesting. You leave it open enough for them to make their own interpretations. And I think that's part of what makes a great role-playing game. I really hope to see the work that you're doing get picked up for, for people to get fascinated into it. Because I know it's your passion. Just like horror is my passion, you have always pushed me to go to that next level to excel, to try and be the best at what I do. And and I want the same for you. I really want people to go and check that out. You know, and you and I have talked about possibility of doing a short or two based off of some of the amazing stories that you have written. And I hope those things come to fruition here in the future. But, um, you know, before we let you go, do you want to let, Is there anything in particular you want to point people towards in terms of games, you know, things that they should be looking at, you know, points of interest so that they can try and get their friends involved, get other people inside? Well, there are two systems that are very simple to pick up that are narrative-based games. Uh, Anything that involves Fate Core, Fate Accelerated, or... uh, Apocalypse engine games such as Dungeon World or Monster of the Week or uh, Monster Hearts. Go to those sites I've mentioned over and over. Mm -hmm. Search for those games. Check them out. I'm sure you'll find something that you want. 
And what's really cool about Evil Cat Productions, the guys that do a lot of the fake horror stuff, a lot of their PDFs, as far as the setting, you can actually download it for free to kind of take a look at it. And then if you decide to go buy one of their hardcover books, if you don't have the PDF, you send them a picture of the book and your receipt, and they'll actually send you a PDF for free. Hmm. Uh, it's an initiative that they call Bits and Mortar. Check it out. Now, one last question. Is there something you want to see in role-playing? Or is there a dynamic that you feel that needs to be brought in? <clears throat> there is so much variety. And so many people on a global... This is a global thing. It's not just the United States or Europe anymore. It's everywhere. Uh, I would like to see something that allows us to have more people that can translate games that are in Spanish to English, vice versa. Uh, we need people who can translate. Because there are some awesome games out there. And there are several games that I have seen developed over the last 25 years that I'm really interested in, but I don't know the language well enough to actually be able to get the, the book in the native language and be able to read it and understand it well enough to do justice to it at the table. There are huge talents out there. Just need some people that can help us find a way to talk to each other a little better. Well, Dave, I want to thank you for coming on the show. You know, it's been a long time coming. Uh, you know, I really want to do more with getting role-playing, both general and specifically horror, out there. You know, I think it's an outlet that sometimes people don't look at. They, like I said, they kind of look at it as that nerd or geek culture, but, you know, it was something that you showed me from, you know, a young age that can Everybody's be enjoyable. Yeah, I Everybody's mean, everyone a has nerd. a nerd element, so. Well, being a nerd is cool, man. It is. It so there definitely really are is. no nerds except the people who aren't nerds. <laughs> how about that? <laughs> oh, how the times have changed. <laughs> well, again, everyone, you know, make sure to check out Coin Toss Games. Right. Um, check out everything that Dave's doing. I will have Dave on in future podcasts. You know, maybe I can get him on here to talk about some of these bad horror movies I've made him watch over the years. <laughs> and we'll definitely. <laughs> We will definitely talk more role-playing with Dave in future episodes. Dave, again, thank you for being on. Thank and you. We'll talk to you soon, brother. And once again, I would like to say thank you to David Henley for coming on and talking to us about role-playing in horror. It's always very fascinating to look back at that time when I had more time to role-play, and, and Dave was such a great game master. I will definitely have him on a future podcast. We will talk certainly more about horror Role playing. Maybe I can also get him to come on and talk about some of the horrific, terrible movies I've made him watch over the years, and some of the ones he's made me watch. I think Turnabout is fair play, but you know he's definitely been an influence in my life when it comes to horror and all the things that go along with that. Coming up in just a few moments, we're going to go into our final digital dismemberment spotlight for the evening where we will be covering Scream Factory's Blu-ray Collector's Edition release of Slither. But before that, we're going to go into our final Metal Massacre spotlight for the evening. The name of the band is Anthelion. The name of the CD is Bloodshed Rebefallen. And the song is The Tomb of Broken Souls.
And welcome back. You just heard Anthelion. The name of the CD was Bloodshed Reba Fallen. And the name of the song was The Tome of Broken Souls. Make sure to head on over to their website. Check out this great Taiwanese band. Find out if they're touring anywhere in the area where you can get more of their CDs. And fantastic band merchandise. But now it's time, ladies and gentlemen, for our final digital dismemberment. And in our final digital dismemberment segment for the evening, we are going to be reviewing Scream Factory's Blu-ray release of the collector's edition of Slither. To give you a little bit more background information on this film, prepare yourself for this terrifying, twisted, and chilling film that critics are calling the most entertaining horror movie in years. It was from Joe Williams of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, by the way. From the co-author and director of Guardians of the Galaxy and Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, comes the deliciously demented story of an unnamed evil wreaking havoc on a small town. Intent on devouring all life on Earth, this dark and slimy entity is infecting anyone in its path. And now it's up to the local sheriff, Bill Party, and his team to stop the spread of rampant devastation and shocking mutilation before it's too late. This outrageously funny horror film also stars Michael Rooker, Elizabeth Banks, and Greg Henry. You know, this, like I said before at the beginning of the show, this is one of those films that I was lucky enough to be able to go and see in theaters when it first came out. And, you know, to me, it's definitely a throwback to the old school alien invasion type films. And, you know, what else needs to be said? You've got aliens, you've got nudity, you've got gore, you've got just a little bit of everything in this. And, you know, again, it's an extremely well-done film. So to kind of give you a little bit more about it, uh, a meteorite crashes in the town of Wilsey, South Carolina, and it unleashes something horrific in the woods. Um... The story primarily takes place with a gentleman by the name of Grant Grant, who, of course, is played by Michael Rooker. And it shows his wife, who is a school teacher. And it seems to be like an odd couple type of marriage. And, you know, you're kind of led to speculation by leaning, listening to people in the town talk about them and why they're together and... You know, it's kind of hinted that she, not so much that she's a gold digger, but it was her way of getting out of a bad life. Well, Grant wants to have relations with his wife one night. She doesn't want to, so he leaves and goes to a bar and runs into uh, another local in town named Brenda, who had had a crush on him when he was a child. And they go into the woods, and Grant finds where the meteorite crashed, and kind of like this gelatinous blob, and he's, he pokes it, it shoots something into him, and it turns out that it's a parasite, and it takes control of his mind, and he starts to change slowly into this monster. So, local pets and stuff start disappearing, but, you know, no one really knows what's going on. His wife, Starla, who's played by Elizabeth Banks, starts to notice... You know, that his health isn't good. He keeps saying that he has an allergic reaction to a bee sting and, you know, things like that. Now, in the town, the sheriff, Bill Party, who was Starless Childhood Crush, you know, tries to reassure her that there's nothing wrong. Well, as this film goes along, Grant infects Brenda with thousands of his parasitic offspring. And he hides her in a bar, in an isolated barn, and her body basically swells up as the baby slugs grow into her. Um, later on, Starla is attacked by Grant, and uh, Bill and the police try to shoot Grant, but he escapes. Bill goes on to hunt for Grant, 
and they eventually find Brenda in the barn bef shortly before she explodes, and all of the alien slugs are all over the place. Almost everyone in his group winds up being infected by the slugs, and as it turns out, they're all part of the same collective consciousness. They all speak uh, with Grant's thoughts, and that's, you know, saying things to Starla that reminds her of her husband. Well, the people that are taken over by the slugs eventually become a almost a form of a zombie. And they go around infecting other people and eating the other townsfolk. You know, so basically all you have left is Starla, Bill, and you have the mayor, Jack McCready, and a young teenage girl, Kylie, who escapes when her family is also infected by the parasites. Now, they, the parasites attempt to infect her, and that's how they know so much about how it's Grant and how they're all part of a collective mass. When one tries to take her over, she sees some of the memories and how it goes from planet to planet and just basically overrunning planets and taking them away, destroying everything that lives there. Um, you know, the alien still has Grant's conscious memories and how he feels about Starla. So the survivors go about trying to find a way to stop this alien slug invasion with pretty much little to no luck. Pretty At the end, it's just the, the young girl, Starla, and the sheriff and uh, just when it seems like all is at its worst, Bill finds a way to fill Grant up with gas, and Starla manages to shoot him and blow him up, which basically destroys the rest of the collective hive, and the rest of the infected die. Um, all the way at the end, you see a cat come up, and he uh, tries to eat part of Grant's remains and is infected, so it always leaves it open to where there could be a sequel to this film. And like I said, this this was really a fun film. The transfer is absolutely stunning. Again, that should come as no surprise being a Scream Factory release. There's nothing about this disc that's not good. The special features are, you know, paramount to any release, and this one has it in spades. You have new audio commentary with writer-director James Gunn and cast members. You have new interviews with James Gunn and actor Greg Henry. Audio commentary with Gunn and actor Nathan Fillion. There's deleted scenes. There's extended scenes. There's bringing Slither's creatures to life. Uh, Slithery set tour with Nathan Fillion. The making of, uh, entitled The Sick Minds and Slimy Days of Slither. There's gag reel, trailers... There's just so much involved with this release. And, you know, one of the things I really liked in one of the behind the scenes, I had mentioned this briefly at the beginning of the show, Gunn kind of talks about how Slither fits in kind of with the Marvel Universe because you see in the Collector's ship, you can see some of the little slugs from Slither in there. So it, it's kind of interesting how... You know, 10 years before the Marvel Universe really began, James Gunn found a way to kind of connect the two. Now, whether or not Marvel would ever see that as official canon is another story that's up to debate. But I still find that to be an interesting side note. And, you know, it doesn't hurt that Michael Rooker, who is part of Guardians of the Galaxy, has a role in this film as well. You know, and it should be remembered, too, that... You know, Gunn, you know, other than Scooby-Doo movies and stuff like that, the Marvel movies, don't forget that he got his start with Tromeo and Juliet. And one of the other little features is a small video blog with Lloyd Kaufman talking about Gunn and being in the film and things like that. So that was really, really cool. Overall, I would give this movie a 4 out of 5. The disc overall is a 10 out of 10. I mean... I don't think that there was anything else that they could have added to this release that would have made it any better than what it was. I would highly recommend that you head on over to ScreamFactory.com and pick up your Blu-ray edition of the Collector's Edition of Slither. 
Well, ladies and gentlemen, once again, it's been one hell of a show. I want to say thank you once again to my guest, David Henley, who's been a friend of mine for years. As I've said before, he was my mentor that got me into role-playing, got me into a lot of different aspects of the horror genre just outside of films. We really hope to have him on again. His wealth of knowledge when it comes to RPGs and older horror is actually quite stunning, and we look forward to having him on again. We would like to say thank you to Screen Factory for sending us both our Blu-ray copies of the Paul Nashy Collection 2, where we featured The Devil's Possessed tonight, and of course, the Blu-ray Collector's Edition of Slither. I want to say also thank you to all of the great musical talent that we had on the show this evening, including Flesh God Apocalypse, Necrogoblicon, and of course, Anthelion. So we hope you enjoyed the show. And until next week, ladies and gentlemen, this is the dead man telling you all to rest in peace.